As we continue looking at functions, now we'll look at how you create new functions from old. And we'll start with operations on functions. Now, let's suppose we have a couple of functions. So let's let f and g be functions. The first way you can combine f and g to create new functions, of course, is to use the arithmetic operations, which are the same operations you use on real numbers arithmetic operations and they result in the following new functions f plus g applied to x would give you f of x plus g of x another new function f minus g of x would give you f of x minus g of x another new function again using these arithmetic operations would be f times g of x, and that's going to be f of x times g of x. And then finally, f over g of x, the quotient, and this one will have a proviso, of course, f of x over g of x, and this will be provided the bottom, g of x, is not zero, because we can't divide by zero. So, these are the arithmetic operations. These produce new functions. Now, there's actually something hidden here that needs to be taken into account. In the beginning, f and g have their own domains. But when they are combined in this way, the domain of the combination has to be the intersection of those two domains. So it is the common domain to the two different functions that you started with. Something to keep in mind. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. The other operation which stands outside of the arithmetic operation is called composition of functions. And it's different because you can't do this with real numbers. This is something you can only do with functions. And here is the idea, and then I'll write the definition on the next page. The idea is as follows. With functions, if you start with an x, say, and you apply a function called g to it and you get a g of x, nothing new there, that's just a function. But with a function, you can apply a second function in sequence. That second function perhaps would be called f, and you get f of g of x in the end. And then this entire function will be called f composed with g. Now that's an open hole, and that will be the new function here that is composed of the old functions. So let's go ahead and look at the proper definition of that. The proper definition is that f composed with g of x, and again that's the open hole as opposed to the closed hole which is used for multiplication. The best way to write this though is to think of it as f of g of x. That function where uh, the domain of the composition is equal to the set of all x values in the domain of g because when you apply this function, remember the x's are starting at the far left, they're far, starting with the g, set of all x in the domain of g, such that g of x, the result of applying g to x, ends up being in the domain of f. And if you look at the picture we had before, you see that x goes to g of x, and then f has to act upon this g of x. So whatever x's are allowed here must be ones that produce g of x's that f can then act upon. So that gives us our definition of the composition of two functions. And here is the note I mentioned earlier, but I will now write it. New functions created in whatever form here always are going to inherit some sort of domain restrictions. They will always inherit domain restrictions. And let me give you an example of that with one of the functions that was not a composition of functions, say, the product of two functions. If, say, f of x is equal to the square root of x, and g of x is likewise equal to the square root of x, so they both are the same function, let us find f times g of x. So this is the product of these two functions. Well, the solution to this is to multiply them, of course, but since we want to concentrate on the domains, let's first look at the domains of the two functions. The domain of f is equal to what? Well, the square root's only defined for zero and positive numbers. So this would be zero to infinity. And that, of course, is the same as the domain of g, since they are the same function. 
then look at what happens. Then if I take f times g of x, which is the product here of these two functions, f of x times g of x, here that's the square root of x times the square root of x, which is x. Now if you think of x alone as a function, it has no restrictions on its domain. However, here it's going to inherit the restrictions that it brings with it from the composition, the product in this case, of square root of x and square root of x. So if I write down the domain of f times g, I'm going to get 0 to infinity including 0. This is the same inherited domain. In fact, we get the whole domain that we inherited this time. Sometimes we only get a part of it. But in this case, this is the domain that this function is restricted to. Even though if you saw a function equal to x with no information, you'd think its domain was all the real numbers. Here, however, it's restricted because of where it came from. Now let's look at another example where we can try composition. f of x is x squared plus 3, say, and g of x is again, say, the square root of x. What we want to do here is find the composition f composed with g and the composition in the other way, g composed with f. Now let's look at these two domains. They will come into play, so let's go ahead and mark them while we're here. The domain of f is all real numbers. You can square and add 3 to any real number. The domain of g, as we already know, is limited to 0 to infinity, including 0. Okay. So if we want to compute these two compositions, and these are open holes, so these are compositions, let's start with the first one, f composed with g of x. Well, by definition, that's f of g of x. g of x, we can just copy down. This is f of the square root of x. And now comes the stage where you have to understand what composition is in order to take the next step. f acts upon this object the way it acts upon all objects. f squares an object and adds 3 to it. So here, we have the square root of x. So f is going to square the square root of x, leaving us with x plus 3. So you see, this was squared and 3 was added to it. This is squared and 3 was added to it. So that's x plus 3. So that is f composed with g. And the domain of f composed with g, let's see. It's restricted by the domain of g because that's where the x's start from. And then what kind of restriction does f add to it? Well, nothing. So the domain is simply what it was for g. Now if we reverse the composition, let's see what happens. This would be g of f of x. And again, f of x is right here, so we can copy it down. Here's g of x squared plus 3. Here again is the step that shows whether you understand composition. What does g do to something? Well, here's g. g takes the square root of something. So here, this is going to give us the square root of, in this case, x squared plus 3. So here is our function g composed with f. First lesson here is, of course, that these are not the same. And in general, you shouldn't expect them to be the same. Composition in two different directions ought to produce, most of the time, something different. What is the domain, just to finish this off, of this second composition? Well, it certainly is going to include it's going to begin with the domain of f. The domain of f happens to be everything, so there's no restrictions. Then g, when applied to it, produces this. So the domain here is going to be not restricted by f at all, but it will be restricted by g. In what way? This expression under here can only be 0 or positive. So the domain of this is going to be where x has x squared plus 3 greater than or equal to 0. There's a verbal description of that domain. Now, we'd like to get a better description of that so we can actually find that out. And we can go ahead and check that. But wait, x squared plus 3 is always positive. 3 is positive. x squared is either 0 or positive, so this is always positive. So there's no check needed here. So in fact, any x will work, and this is all real numbers. So it looked like we might have work to do there, but in fact, we don't in this case. And uh, let's just stop there. That will be a couple of good examples of how functions are combined, and we'll go on and look at something else.
Let's ask ourselves how these operations on functions affect the function graphs. So let's go ahead and look at that. For our example here, just so we have a function to look at, let's just look at f of x equals x squared. We'll keep that as our simple example here. The first operation that you can perform on functions is an operation that results in the translation of the graph. And we'll take c greater than 0 here, and you'll see where the c comes in in just a minute. So for translation, if you want the function graph to move left, then you compute f of x plus c. That will cause the function to move to the left. Now, the original function here, I guess I should draw it here so we remind ourselves, there's the original parabola. And it is shifted left by c. We're assuming c is positive here. If you compute f of x plus c. So if you replace x everywhere by x plus c, this is what will happen to the picture. If you want to move right, you do f of x minus c. And in the same way, you will end up with the parabola move to the right. If you want to go up, you just take the original y value f of x and add c to it. And what that will do is it will push the original parabola up by c. And if you want to go down, as you might expect, f of x minus c. And that will take your original parabola and shift it downward to minus c. So those are the operations you can perform to a function to affect its graph in these four ways. There is another way that you can affect the graph. These four ways are called translations. You're not rotating or turning the graph. You're just shifting it right or left or up or down. You can also do reflection. If you take and calculate f of minus x, what that does is take the original picture and shift it across the y-axis. Now, there's no change here, but that's only because it is the x squared function. Usually, there will be a difference when, of course, you reflect it across the y-axis. The other thing you can do for reflection, if you take the negative of the original function, this one's easier to see, the function just flips over. So this is an up-down reflection. And that flips, flips you across the x-axis. What else can we do? Well, we can do stretches or compressions. And these are accomplished by multiplication. If you multiply the original function f of x by c, and c is a number bigger than 1, then, for example, if c is 2, it's going to double all the y values. So that's certainly going to be a stretch. And it's going to stretch it, since we're doubling y values, this would be a vertical stretch. And so in our picture for the parabola, we're going to get a long, skinny parabola that's been stretched vertically. If you multiply c times f of x again, but this time you take your positive c between 0 and 1, you get a vertical compression. So what happens is the parabola now becomes low and wide. And we're skipping 1 here because that doesn't change the function at all, of course. If you multiply the x value by c first, and then apply the function to it, where c is greater than 1, this time you have the effect that is horizontal. And this will be horizontal compression. And in this case, horizontal compression looks exactly like a vertical stretch for a parabola. So it's actually going to look just the same in this particular case. And if you apply f to cx, where c is between 0 and 1, you get a horizontal stretch. So it stretches in the right to left direction. And in that case, it's going to look a lot like vertical compression due to the nature of this function. So this is the kind of stretch that you would get. So those are operations. Uh, the stretches, the compressions, the translations, and the reflections that cause certain kinds of things to happen to the graph. Let's do an example of the sort of thing that you ought to be able to do. Sketch the following function. y equals 4 minus the absolute value of x minus 2. The solution here is to realize that this is a combination of operations that affect the graph of the core function, which is the absolute value function here. So we can do this pictorially and see what's happening. If we start with the absolute value function, that's that 45 degree line, 
y equals absolute value of x. And then we work our way forward. First of all, change it to the absolute value of x minus 2. What does that do? That is going to be a translation. As we just saw, that translates the curve to the right by 2. So this is y equals the absolute value of x minus 2. Then, if we multiply that by a minus 1, what happens is that we reflect the curve through the x-axis. This is still 2 here, but now it's facing downward. So this is y equals minus the absolute value of x minus 2. And finally, we need to add this 4, and that will shift the curve up. So we'll still have this previous shape, this downward pointing arrow, and we will need to move it up, centered here at 2, and it will go up to a height of 4. So it will look something like this when we're done. And this is the curve y equals 4 minus the absolute value of x minus 2 that we were trying to graph. And so this illustrates what you should be able to do if you start with some sort of core function. In this case, the absolute value function could be x squared, could be any number of other functions, and then apply certain operations to it, and this is how the graphs are affected. Now, one more item regarding graphs, functions with symmetric graphs. There are two sorts of functions that are very common, and we will see them as we move along. Some of them will be uh, trigonometric functions. Some of them will be powers of x. And here are the definitions that will be appropriate. f is called an even function if, when you take f and you evaluate it at minus x, so this is the test. If you evaluate x, f rather, at minus x, and you get back f of x as though there were no change, you have what's called an even function. What is interesting about that? Well, what's interesting about it is that this sort of a function is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So if this is your axis system, this curve is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. It is the same on either side. It is reflected as in a mirror. The other definition that is useful to us is f is odd. And what would that be? Well, again, you take exactly the same test case. You take f of minus x. You put minus x in wherever x is. If, in the end, you end up with minus the original function, instead of here with even, where you just got the original function, if you have the negative, this produces a function whose graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. Now, that means that if you go across the origin, you have symmetry. Let me show you what an example of that might be. If we take a function like f of x equals x cubed, and this is where the name came from. Odd powers were the first examples of odd functions, although they're not the only ones. If you look at the graph of this from your own experience, you have a graph that looks like this. And notice that if I have a point over here, that there is a matching point here that is on a line through the origin. Well, that is exactly the characteristic that defines a function which is symmetric with respect to the origin. And so both of these sorts of functions, even and odd, are going to occur again and again, and it's good to have these definitions straight. Time for a couple of exercises. Our first exercise will begin with the function f of x equals x squared. And a second function, g of x equals, say, the square root of 1 minus x. What we want to do here is find the composition f composed with g and the composition g composed with f and their domains. So go ahead and calculate those compositions, work out their domains, and we'll be back. Let's see how these compositions worked out. First, I'm going to look at the domains of the two functions just so I have that information. When I want to compute the domains of the composition, it would be nice to know that. So let us note that the domain of the original function f, which is x squared, is all of the real numbers, because you can square any real number. And the domain of g, well, that might take a little more work. The domain of g is going to be where 1 minus x is greater than or equal to 0, because 1 minus x is under the square root, and the square root's only defined for numbers that are 0 or positive. 
where one minus x is greater than or equal to zero. Well, let's see what that would lead to. That means one must be greater than or equal to x. That tells me exactly what x should be. So that means the domain of g ought to be the interval from minus infinity to one, including one. That would be exactly x less than or equal to one. So I have my two domains there. And let me mark them off so I don't lose them. And let's go ahead now and look at the compositions. So f composed with g is f of g of x. And again, I can copy g of x straight down from here. So this is f of the square root of 1 minus x. And here is the key quality where I see if I understand composition. What does f do to something? f squares that something. So if f squares the square root, this is going to leave me with 1 minus x. So this is 1 minus x. What would be the domain of this function? The domain of f composed with g? Well, let's see. The original function here is g. g has a restricted domain, which was this interval. And then f acts upon it, and f squares it. f has no restrictions. So the domain of this function, although 1 minus x has no restrictions, if it stands by itself, since it is the product of this composition, it inherits the restrictions that lie in there. And so this domain is going to be minus infinity to 1 as an inherited restriction. So this is inherited. Likewise, if we compute g composed with f, that's g of f of x. That's g of x squared, remembering that f is x squared here. What does g do to something? g takes the square root of 1 minus that something. So this is the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that is the equality that tells whether you understand composition. So here is the function I end up with, the square root of 1 minus x squared. What is its domain? Well, there's no restriction inherited from the f part, because f was defined here for all real numbers. So the only restriction is going to be what g imposes. And so this must make sense. We need 1 minus x squared to be greater than or equal to 0. Well, now we just work out the algebra to see what that implies. This means that 1 is greater than or equal to x squared. And note that if it is x squared, x squared is greater than or equal to 0. If we take the square root throughout, we get 1 greater than or equal to the square root of x squared greater than or equal to 0. And you may remember, and you should, that the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. So this is 1 greater than or equal to the absolute value of x greater than or equal to 0. If you look at the number line, here's 0 and here's 1. This says that the absolute value of x is between 0 and 1. So it's over here. What does that say about x? That says that x itself could go as far down as minus 1, and its absolute value would still lie in here. So that tells me that the interval that I'm looking for is going to be minus 1 to 1 as the domain of this function. So I hope, after your work, that that's what you came up with. And we will now look at another example. In this example, it'll involve a sketch. So we want to sketch the function y equals x squared plus 2x by completing the square. A nice algebraic operation you should remember. It's good to practice. Completing the square and transforming as we did in an example earlier, transforming the graph of the core function here, which is x squared. So give that a try, and we'll be back. In this problem, the first thing we need to do is algebra. We need to complete the square. So let's write this down, y equals x squared plus 2x. To complete the square is to come up with the constant that will go there to make this into the perfect square of a binomial. So what we're supposed to do is look at the coefficient of x, take 1 half of it, which is 1, plus 1 in this case, square it, and add it. Now, of course, you can't change the problem, so we must also subtract that away. This now, by design, is equal to x plus 1 quantity squared, and we have now this minus 1. So y has been rewritten so that we see that it is a translated version of y equals x squared, and that's what we wanted to look at. So here's completing the square.
If we now look at the graph, we can see how to get there from the core function y equals x squared. So here's the original y equals x squared. It is the common parabola. And let's walk our way forward. First of all, let's add 1 to x, which results, remember, in a shift to the left of the parabola, 1. So this is y equals x plus 1 squared. And one final thing, we need to subtract 1. That will shift this parabola downward. So we'll end up with, here is the 1. And we're going to shift by minus 1. So that's going to give us a parabola that looks something like this, which has its vertex here at 1 minus 1. And this is our function x plus 1 squared minus 1. That's what we needed to do here. I hope that that's what you ended up with. We examine now some families of functions. Now, a family of functions is a, a set of functions that have the same format where certain parameters change. The first family we'll look at is the power function family, y equals x to the p power. We'll start with one of the simplest measures, members of that family, y equals x, and variations on it. Actually, the more general form would be y equals mx plus b, which, of course, everybody knows is the equation of a line. There are two parameters here, m and b. And as you vary them, different things happen to the pictures. If m varies, so the slope varies, but b remains fixed, the picture that you get is something that looks like this. Suppose b is a positive number, so I can mark it up here. This would be b. The slope will vary, but b is fixed. What is b? It's the y-intercept of the curve. So that means you will have graphs of various sorts looking like this. This is the family. All the lines that pass through this vertical height of b, where the slope can be anything, because the slope is allowed to vary. So all of these lines pass through the point on the y-axis b, which is the point with coordinates 0 b. That's what happens if m varies here. If we allow b to vary, so we keep m fixed, so the slope is always the same, but b varies. Well, b just determines where vertically the line is going to strike the y-axis. m being fixed means it's always going to strike at the same slope. So the picture that we get is something like this. This is all these lines have the same slope, which is m. And there will be infinitely many of them going up and down. All of the ones that have slope m will be indicated by the family if we leave m fixed and let b vary. So these are two examples of families of functions. And sometimes it's helpful to know all the properties of a family so that you can examine the family as a whole and draw certain conclusions. Let's continue to look at this power family. And let us look at the case, well, we're going to look at the case y equals x to the n. Now, in this one, we'll choose n greater than or equal to 1 and an integer. And n, an integer, will be the parameter here. First, we'll examine x to the n, where n is even. In that case, the graphs of this family look like this. First of all, notice that if n is even, if x is 0, you get 0, no matter what the n is. Also, if x is 1 or minus 1, you will always get a value of 1. That is give us three anchors, if you like, for this picture. There's 1, there's minus 1. All of the curves have to pass through all of those. Now, you know the familiar one, if, x, if we have x squared here at n equals 2. We have the familiar parabola that would pass through here like so. But as the ends get larger and larger, what will happen is that you'll get parabolic-like looking curves, but they will vary. Some will be higher, some can be lower. But they will all pass through those three points, and that will be the defining characteristic of this family. Now, if we look at y equals x to the n, where n is odd, in this case, the curves look considerably different. The first odd case is y equals x. And you know what that looks like. That is simply the 45 degree line here. 
running through the origin. Now what happens if you have y equals x cubed or y equals x to the fifth and so on? Well you get curves that look like this and there are some anchor points here too. Let's go ahead and mark those. Again it's the same three. Zero, one here no matter what power you take one to it's always going to be one. Minus one here when you take minus one to an odd power it becomes negative. Here when you took minus one to a power it would become positive because it was always an even power. So all of the curves are going to pass through these three points. So you'll get variations on this of all sorts depending on the power involved. But that's a description of that family in a graphical way. Let's continue to look at this family. If n is an integer and not greater than or equal to 1, can we say something about that? Well, sure. If n is uh, greater than or equal to 1, n is an integer, but instead of looking at the y equals x to the n curves we saw before, let's look at y equals x to the minus n curves. So that's like looking at the negative integer powers. So this would be 1 over x to the n. And first of all, again, let's look at the n e equal an even number case. If you graph these, here are the pictures you get. Again, the same thing happens. This and fortunately in this case you don't have this defined at zero but it is defined at one and at minus one and because n is even it's always going to give you the same value which is a height of one so those two points will always be passed through notice that since this is not defined at zero for any power this will always be undefined on the y-axis so the kind of pictures you get are pi pictures that come in two pieces and they might look something like that or maybe like this and there'll be a lot of them an infinite number in fact of curves that look roughly like this they will all pass through these two points and all have the y-axis as an asymptote if you look at y equals x to the minus n which of course is one over x to the n for n odd what happens is that again it's not defined at zero at 1, 1 goes up to a height of 1. Minus 1, because it's an odd power, is going to go down to a depth of minus 1. And the first example, of course, is the 1 over x curve, which everyone knows, something like this. And then other curves will have similar shapes, but maybe come in a little tighter, and so on, as the power of n goes higher and higher. So here are, again, graphical images of these families and that's a good place to stop. Our next set of families are the polynomial function and rational function families. Let's first look at the polynomial functions and I hope these are familiar to, to you from your past experience. One of the characteristics of these functions in their graphs is that they have no asymptotes, either horizontal or vertical and they have this sort of general form a function is a polynomial function if it looks like this say c naught plus c one x plus up to c n x to the n and of course is a positive integer or zero and c n in any case is non-zero so that this is really the highest power what kind of examples do we have here well you should know these from your experience let's look at a few of them n equal one if n equals one then we have something like this form and that's the line and we've seen lines before and so we have lines that may come at various uh, slopes and passing through various uh, values along the y-axis if n equals two we have quadratics or parabolas if you like to call them that here is the standard parabola but that parabola as you know can be shifted up or down it can also be flipped over and so there are various versions of this can be stretched or compressed. n equals 3, these get a little harder to draw as time goes on here. If you look at n equals 3, we're looking at cubics. Here is a familiar standard cubic. That cubic can also come up very high and go down very low. And like the others, it can be shifted. It can also go in the other direction. So these are variations. You can see there are two humps here, which is sort of a defining characteristic for cubics, and so on, etc. These are just examples of polynomials, and they can form a family which is nicely described by this format here. Then let's just take a momentary look at rational functions. 
and see what sort of family they might form. The rational functions, well, we start with a very familiar one, this one here. This is the y equals 1 over x, perhaps the simplest rational function. And you see, one of its characteristics is that it has an asymptote, a vertical asymptote. It also has a horizontal asymptote, so it's sort of I I expressing the fact that uh, rational functions may have both. In fact, they may have both one or either. And this is different from polynomial functions, which we just saw have no asymptotes. Here is another example of a rational function, y equals 1 over x squared plus 1. It looks like this. It has a horizontal asymptote, as you see, but no vertical asymptote. So it's not guaranteed that there'd be a vertical asymptote if you're a rational function. And then, et cetera. In general, you can get all sorts of pictures. Here's a picture you might get. You might have something where you have a couple of asymptotes. Maybe the rational function goes up like this, maybe does something like this in between, and maybe this off to the right. So the y-axis and this line here, wherever it is, this vertical line, is an asymptote, vertical asymptotes. And maybe we could even do this and get a horizontal asymptote here. So a rational function can have many of these properties together. It really depends on exactly what its form is. But these can all be lumped together sometimes when we want to talk about them as a family.